everything you need to know about Israel through the songs of Ehud Banai. So that's our rather ambitious title. The chances are that you're not going to find out everything that you need to know about Israel. But through four songs of Ehud Banai, we might be able to say, this is Israel, according to Ehud Banai. And we're going to be working with these songs of Banai, not necessarily to use them as some kind of sociological document to teach us about specific aspects of Israel, but we're going to try and experience Israel through Ehud Banai's eyes and through our ears. A bit of an introduction to Ehud Banai himself. His first album was released in 1987. There were several hits in that first album and he's continued to be a successful singer-songwriter ever since. All his albums are great successes and he tours the country to packed houses. He comes from a famous showbiz family with uncles and cousins and nephews and nieces all involved in TV or in music. If you've heard of Eviatao Banai or Meir Banai, the actress Orna Banai, and so on. Over the years, his Persian religious background has come to influence the subjects and the sounds of his music, as we will experience as we go through these four songs. But before going into these four songs, a useful framing of the way in which Banai sees and hears Israel will actually come from a piece of Talmud, which is quite close to his heart, as we'll find out later. This is a piece from the Babylonian Talmud, Chagiga 14b. It's often known as the story of the four, the tale of the four, or the story of the Pardes. Four entered the orchard, and they are as follows. Ben Azai and Ben Zoma, the other and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said to them, When you reach pure marble stones, do not say water, water, because it is stated, He who speaks falsehood shall not be established before my eyes. Ben Azai glimpsed and died. Ben Zoma glimpsed and was harmed. The other chopped down the shoots. Baba Akiva came out safely. So let's break this down a little bit and you'll begin to understand why this seems to be a useful framing for Banai's Israel. The orchard, the pardes, the orchard is often used as an image of the Garden of Eden and the word pardes, you can even hear in it, pardes, paradise, the roots of the word for paradise come from this idea of pardes, the orchard. And so in that sense, when four entered the orchard, it's not like they were going in to pick apples. This is a description of a mystical journey into paradise, into heaven, in order to meet with the divine. Ben Azai, Ben Zoma and Rabbi Akiva are famous rabbis, but then we have the other. His real name is Rabbi Elisha Ben Avuya. And in fact, this is one of the key stories that explains to us why Elisha Ben Avuya ends up being referred to as the other, Ha'acher. So Rabbi Akiva, who's done this before clearly, says when you reach pure marble stones, don't say water, water. So what's he talking about? It would seem that in this pardes, in this Garden of Eden mystical journey, there is marble stone which is so pure that you could mistake it for water. And what Akiva says is you mustn't call it water because that would be false. It's not water, it's marble. And at the same time, it seems that what we're being told is that you mustn't make assumptions about this place. You mustn't apply your earthbound eyes to what you're seeing here. You need to see cleanly and freshly because this is a completely different world. So what happens to them when they're in this world isn't clear, but we know what happens afterwards. Ben Azai glimpsed and died. Benzoma glimpsed and was harmed, and from this we understand that he lost his mind, he went crazy. The other chopped down the shoots. He loses his faith. He chops down the roots of his connection 
to the Jewish people, his connection to God, and his connection to his fellow rabbis. And this is why he ends up being called the Other. He has made crucial interventions in explaining the law, and so his word needs to be quoted in the Talmud. But because he has become somebody who is so shunned, he's got to be othered, and he needs to be given the name of the Other. They kind of name him, but they don't name him. He's not only shunned in the book, he's shunned in public, in his real life. They apply this kind of triple social distancing to him. No one's allowed to go close to him or learn from him. He is shunned in public. He is othered. And in this story, I think we pull out some ways in which we can say this is Banai's Israel. First of all, in many of his songs, he experiences Israel and living in Israel as this strange toggling between living in exile and coming back to the Holy Land. Is this place heaven? Is it earth? Is it a connection to the ancient history of the place or is it a connection to here and now and the very real present? It's a constant toggling without a decision necessarily being made. There's always danger or even death in Banai's Israel. We're always in transit. There's always a journeying. There's always on the way. We have never quite arrived in Banai's Israel. Banai himself is not always clear whether he's dreaming this place or whether it's reality. And our final theme is in relation to Banai's role. Is he a Rabbi Akiva figure? taking us round carefully and offering us wise advice? Or is he the other? Is he the dangerous one? Is he the guide? Or is he the iconoclast? And overlaying these main themes, all of which we can find in this Talmudic text, is this feeling that Israel is sui generis. It's not like anything else. And bringing comparisons from the rest of the world are rarely helpful. It's like this. It reminds me of that. Well, it may well be, but it might be that these comparisons distort rather than illuminate, and that Israel must be experienced aesthetically through the senses. <laughs> The first song we're looking at is Brooklyn. So I suggest you go listen to the song right now. Up in the top right hand corner, you can see that you can click on that I and you'll get to hear the song together with an embedded subtitled translation. <laughs> Eud Banai, an Israeli, has been wandering around Brooklyn, New York and describing it to himself as if it's Jerusalem. Similar to this idea of saying water, water, when one's really looking at marble. So there's this conversation of holy Brooklyn, profane Brooklyn, Brooklyn revealed, Brooklyn hidden, which is Kabbalistic language, a higher Brooklyn and a subway Brooklyn, which is this lovely play on words. In Hebrew and in Jewish thought, we talk of Yerushalayim shel ma'ala Yerushalayim shel mata, higher Jerusalem and lower Jerusalem, the more mundane day-to-day -day Jerusalem. And here he's talking, rather than Lamat, he's talking Tachtit. So he's also referring to the subway in Brooklyn. And so what we have here is this, again, this toggling between where am I? Am I in Brooklyn? Am I in Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem really Brooklyn? Is Brooklyn really Jerusalem? We're not all that clear. Other key lines that emerge from this song, I'm not from here but not entirely foreign. That feeling that pretty much every Jew gets when they visit Israel is exactly the feeling that the Israeli is getting when he visits Brooklyn. I'm not from here, but not entirely foreign on my journey. My journey to understand what Israel is and who I am as an Israeli. I even have to take a trip to Brooklyn to find out. And here again, Brooklyn, did you exist or did I dream? I won't be here tomorrow, I'm only today. 
So again, we have this dreamlike understanding of existence and the awareness that mortality is always around. And here in this line, I won't be here tomorrow, I'm only today. He plays with a slightly ungrammatical structure to suggest, like often happens if you want to go inside a museum or inside a building and they'll tell you that it's only open tomorrow. And you say, well, I can't get here tomorrow because I'm only here today. But I'm only today suggests that there's also an understanding of mortality and the temporariness of life. Moving on to a second song, Black Labour, Avoda Shkora. This song came out in 1987 about the Ethiopian Jewish community in Israel. As we now know, Ethiopians were Zionists before the Europeans kind of invented political Zionism. Abba Mehari led a group in Ethiopia to the Promised Land back in 1869. The first Ethiopians to arrive in Israel came in 1934, which is a good 14 years before the establishment of the state. But in the 1980s, some 17,000 Ethiopian Jews arrive in Israel through the leadership of Fredi Aklum in Ethiopia and the Mossad. And their arrival was not smooth. The rabbinate in Israel, in order to recognize that they were Jewish and therefore affirm their right to become citizens of Israel, they sometimes insisted on a symbolic second circumcision, a drawing of blood, and often Ethiopian Jews were required to undergo almost a, a conversion through the mikveh. This was seen as deeply humiliating, in particular for people who had walked thousands of miles through the desert, through torture in Sudan, in order to arrive here, having been Zionists for at least a hundred years, to have their Judaism questioned was extremely painful. And in 1985, the Ethiopian community began to protest. And this song by Ehud Banai was released soon thereafter. So up in the top right hand corner, you have the link to the song and we'll meet you back here. <music> Pulling out a few ideas from black labor, who would know if Abraham were not black, sings Banai. Again, we've got the iconoclast coming in here, asking the questions that the white Israelis have never asked themselves nor necessarily wanted to ask themselves. And even at home, the exile continues. So on the one hand, this is of course a crucial social and political statement, a protest that these people have come all the way in order to be at home in the Jewish homeland and yet they continue to be exiled. And at the same time, we have again this idea that Israel and Israelis were still on the way even at home, the exile continues. The Eve of Yom Ha'atzma'ut is a relatively new song of El Ban. I came out in 2020, and as he says at the beginning, it's based on a true dream. So go listen to the song and we'll explore certain aspects of it later. Up in the top right hand corner, click to the song. So what have we here in this story based on a true dream? Yom Ha'atzma'ut is this classic time when musicians are traveling all around the country. Musicians quite often will play five or six different gigs throughout the day, getting into the van, driving off to the new place, getting in the van and driving to another place. And sometimes you arrive in places where they're not really concert halls and you kind of have to make do. And in this crazy space, we have this chorus, the nation burns incense, makes burnt offerings and sacrifices. Here we have this reference to the days of the temple, but at the same time, it's referring to Yom Ha'atzmaut, Israel's Independence Day, where everybody is barbecuing. So everybody has ala esh, and so there's this feeling that this is something like the animal sacrifices that were taking place in the temple. And again, we have this feeling that we're toggling between ancient and new. Is he talking about Yom Ha'atzma'ot or is he talking about sacrifices in the temple or both at the same time? The crowd is mixed east and west and Eritreans who got lost in the desert. Eritrean refugees who've arrived in Israel in the past few years and are suffering pretty badly for lack of status. Indeed, 
the previous song that we talked about, Black Labour, has even been remade by Banai and various friends to refer to the state of the Eritrean refugees or asylum seekers. Furious activists waving fists and shouting to me, your time is up. Here he's actually referring to the fact that one of his famous songs is called Your Time Is Up, Zman Avar. And so he's not quite clear whether they're shouting to him to say, get off the stage, let's have the next artist in, or whether they're talking about, please play the next song. Tiras Kham is written on that big pot, hot corn. That's a reference to a famous children's book called Tiras Kham. And even the writing on the tin is pretty much the same writing as you'll find in the children's book. It's again a reference to that which we have in common, whilst throughout the song we're finding out how much Israel is split into 10 million different pieces. You've got the kibbutz dance troupe with their doing their horror on the left and of course on the right you have the settlers with their herd of goats and an American rabbi on a flying kafir which was seen to be a reference to the perception that rabbis from America tend to be pro-Palestinian and someone else says not Halel Tahanun this is talking to the idea that on Yom Ha'atzma'ut we haven't yet decided whether the creation of the state of Israel was a miracle or not so in the religious orthodox world, there are disagreements as to whether we say Hallel or not, whether we acknowledge that there's been a miracle taking place in the establishment of the state of Israel, or whether this was something that human beings achieved. But someone else is saying, forget giving praise for a miracle. Why aren't we saying Tahanun, which is why aren't we in mourning for this idea of this strange country on the day that we're celebrating this strange country? What's going on? asks the Bedouin. Where's the peace? How did this dream become a nightmare? Is Banai talking about this particular day, this particular dream, or is he talking about Israel altogether? We're not altogether sure. And he's left alone on this strange stage where behind him it says, which is actually a reference to Sukkot, not to Yom Ha'atzma'ot anyway. And we're left wondering, has Banai been celebrating Israel or has he been warning of its downfall or just holding his head at the terrible schisms between all these people who seem to be having a party at the same time in the wrong kind of place? The iconoclast comes through. And our final song is Tale of the Four. All I want to say about this song is, first of all, you should know that Banai has sometimes introduced this song by saying it's a song about a bad trip that he and his friends had when they were kids. But as you listen to the song, you will find yourself recognising an ancient story in there. Click up top right where the little eye is, and we'll see you back here. That's right, the song itself is a whole midrash around the tale of the four going into the Pardes, and yet he's overlaid it with the current day. We continue to toggle between heaven and earth and then and now. There's danger on this journey, and we are still on a journey. It's not clear if this is dreamlike, if this is real or unreal, and we're certainly not clear, even by the end of this journey, whether Banai is a guide, an iconoclast, or both. But we know that this is Israel. This is Israel through Banai's songs and Banai's words. This has been brought to you by Makom the Israel Education Lab for the Jewish Agency, in a project together with Moisha House, which has been generously funded by the Jim Joseph Foundation. You will be able to find a breakdown of each one of these songs in more depth at the playlist which you can see on the screen. <laughs>